Hello everybody and welcome to another reading wrap up. It's been a couple of weeks mainly because I've been very busy with home improvement projects. My house has a new roof and I'm working on building a porch with my dad. That makes it sound like I'm doing much of the work. I'm not really. <laughs> my dad is doing most of the work but I'm trying to be there to help. So my free time and my weekends have been all about like just trying to keep the house together and stuff moving along. So um, I still have been reading though, so let's talk about what I have read in the past couple of weeks. First up is Siren Queen by Ni Vo. This one, it has beautiful writing. I think it nails the atmosphere it's going for, and it's very much about an era I'm not interested in. <laughs> So I love Nevo as an author, just her writing is so wonderful, but the story just didn't really work for my taste, let's say. Um, it is about a Chinese-American young woman um, in the 1930s who wants to be a movie star. She's on film sets from an early age as like an extra, and she just, she wants to be famous. She wants to have that thing. Um, and she's willing to make some rather occult bargains to achieve her dream, but then she's trying to find a way to have what she wants without also like literally selling her soul or whatever. So it's it's very noir. It has this very like smoky occult atmosphere to it because there's also a lot of supernatural. Like this is the early days of Hollywood and everything really is supernatural. Um, and I thought that was a really interesting idea, even if the execution of it and this time period really wasn't my thing. So I'm really glad that I tried to read this. It worked for me a lot better than Nevo's previous nov novel, which I can never remember the name of. Anyway, it's the Great Gatsby retelling. I bounced off of that one pretty hard. Um, and this one did work better for me, but still just an era I don't super love. Next was Quite a Pleasant Surprise. It is A Green and Ancient Light by Frederick S. Durbin. I read this as part of a book group, so I didn't pick it. I don't think I really even heard of it before. And it turns out it's a very gentle fantasy novel, I think kind of exploring the magic that one experiences during childhood. There's genuine magic in the story, but it is certainly enhanced by that feeling of childhood, the turning point in your childhood when you go from just being a child to realizing that there are horrible things happening in the world. So I think this story is, it's intentionally written in a way where it, it doesn't mention specific people's names, um, it doesn't mention places or time period, because it, maybe it wants to be a little bit general, like it could be happening anywhere at any time. But for me, it was very obvious that it, it felt like a young boy during World War II goes to the country to live with a relative because, you know, London's being bombed or whatever. It's that time period. Um, so it is about a young boy. He's nine years old. He goes to live with his grandmother for the summer. Um, his father is off fighting in the war. His mother and newborn sister are back in town. And he goes on some adventures with his grandmother, um, specifically exploring a, like, monster garden in the woods near where her cottage is. Um, and like, who created these statues of monsters? What do they mean? There might be clues in the inscriptions on the statues and what does that mean? And also the grandmother has a very interesting friend who lives in the wood. And I really love this. I think perhaps I read it at the right time where I wanted something gentle, where there was no specific villain, there were bad things happening, but a lot of them were off screen. It just, it, it gave me what I wanted in the moment. I think it was really well written as well. So a nice standalone fantasy novel about being a child and having adventures and just good family dynamics as well. I super enjoyed it. Next up, I want to talk about two books that I got as NetGalley arcs. So thank you to NetGalley and the publishers. I don't know why, but I went on this little like spree of requesting arcs on NetGalley, which I almost never do these days. And all three of them are being published in August. So I'm trying to read them this month during new release a thon So I'm two down and I'm part of the way through the third. I'm doing pretty well, actually. Uh, so the first one is Love on the Brain by Allie Hazelwood. This is part of the same 
same contemporary romance series as The Love Hypothesis, which is one of my favorite romance novels I read last year. I love that book. Um, and I think the idea of this series, they're not really like plot or character connected, but they're about like women in STEM fields, the stories take place in the lab and all of that. I really like this. Um, Love on the Brain, like all of my positives about this book is that it gave me the same feeling and that same intense desire to read the whole thing in one sitting as The Love Hypothesis. Like I got super into it. But my negative things to say about this book, I guess, are that this book was so similar to The Love Hypothesis. So I really enjoyed it. It was like a four out of five star read for me. That's pretty darn good. But by the time that I got done with the book, I realized there were just so many similarities with The Love Hypothesis. And I wondered if that was going to be a trend with Allie Hazelwood's books. Um, so yeah, this one is kind of enemies to lovers, but they weren't really enemies to begin with. It was just a big misunderstanding. So this one is about B and Levi. They had known each other tangentially. I think when they were doing like their doctoral work, they had the same like thesis advisor. And for some reason, B just thought that Levi always really hated her. And then her career isn't quite going so well, but his has. He's been off more on an engineering track while she's been on a, like a neuroscience, neurobiology track. And then they come together as co-leads at a like joint venture at NASA, which is building a, a helmet for astronauts. I don't understand if that project is even feasible or not. Anyway, I think th this whole story was just the love hypothesis, the characters, their personalities, the miscommunication, the misunderstandings, but to an even greater degree. It felt much more dramatic and exaggerated. And the dynamic between the two main characters was really similar to what's their names? Olive and Adam from the love hypothesis. So it's like the love hypothesis redo. And I can't really be mad about it because I super enjoyed it. But I admit to having this little bit of niggling doubt or uncertainty about whether this was as good as the first book because it felt like a repeat. I guess what I'm saying about Love on the Brain is that if you liked the love hypothesis and you want more of that, but even more intense, then this is the book for you. I enjoyed it and I will probably read more by Allie Hazelwood in the future. <laughs> the other NetGalley arc that I have to talk about today is The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches by Sangu Mandana. This has a great title and a really cute cover and that honestly is why I wanted to read it. Um, I enjoyed this. Um, I think it was a little bit too cute in some sections for me. Like I could feel my teeth hurting from the sweetness just a little bit, um, but I enjoyed it. So it's basically contemporary witchy fiction with a small romance plot in there. Um, it is about a 20-something witch named Mika Moon. Um, witches exist in this world, but in the society at least that Mika has been raised in, um, witches are never supposed to be around each other for fear of them being found out, but also because magical accidents happen more frequently when witches are around each other. So Mika has been raised by like an adoptive parent in a really weird way that kept her very isolated from people, and she has issues from that. She is used to never getting attached to people, to save herself from a lot of heartbreak. And as you can see where this is going, she gets a found family and a romantic interest that she wants to stay with, but she has to get over her reaction of just like walking away to prevent any emotional complications. Uh, so basically, Mika is asked to come train or teach some very young witches, these little girls who have been taken in by an, an older witch who is not around anymore. It was a bit of a mystery about why this witch is behaving the way that she is. So Mika shows up and is like, I'm not going to get attached, I'm not going to get attached, but then this family just takes her in and she fits there so well and the the household librarian, he's like an academic librarian, is super cute and grumpy in the sweetest way and she is like into him and the little girls are cute and everything. But there's this impending deadline of like teaching the little witches to control their power so they're not revealed to somebody who's going to show up. But also like, where is Lillian, the witch who adopted them? Why isn't she helping with all of this? So 
there is kind of a darker twist at the end of the story that I was not expecting. I spent a lot of the book thinking that the imposed deadline, like the, the, the tension building device in the story was kind of silly. It just didn't make much sense to me. And then there was actually more to it than that. And I kind of half guessed what was going on. I guessed a connection between characters pretty early on. So I'm not sure that I think the plot of this was incredibly strong, but I do think that it was essentially a really good metaphor for people who don't fit in so much, who are different, either invisibly different, so they're trying to hold themselves apart from the rest of society to protect themselves, or like obviously different because of their ethnicity, their skin color, that sort of thing. And trying to find that place where you fit, where you are safe to be yourself, but also finding some strength to stand up and say to others that you are not going to be you know, scared into hiding yourself forever, that you have to, it's not enough to survive, you also have to live and like try to live well. And I think that that was a really good message from the entire book for me. That's what I took away from it and what I enjoyed the most about the story. So it was very cute. It was a little bit of a fluffy read and I would kind of recommend it. Like if you want something with a bit of a romantic side to it, but not explicit romance or whatever. This has a good subplot about that as well. So very enjoyable. I'd never heard of this author before. I know she has some other books out and I think that they are like YA fantasy, but I will definitely keep my eye out for any of her future fiction. If she writes more in this world, I'll definitely pick it up. Completely different from that, not cute and fluffy at all, we have What Moves the Dead by T. Kingfisher. So, um, you know I love Ursula Vernon and I particularly enjoy the works that she publishes under her T. Kingfisher pen name. I talked about her previous 2022 release, Nettle and Bone, recently, and What Moves the Dead is her second one coming out this year. It came out in July. And this is a horror novella. It is a retelling of The Fall of the House of Usher by Poe. I believe, which I've, I've never read the original story. So it was interesting to read this and come to it like completely fresh. I didn't know anything about it. Um, and it was sufficiently creepy. So yeah, this is about a non-binary soldier from a fictional like European country. So the soldier Easton comes to their friend's um, like ancestral home and discovers that the woman and her brother are deathly ill. Something horrible is happening in this home. And there's something very creepy happening with the mushrooms and the possibly possessed hairs running around. Um, I liked this quite a bit. It wasn't as disturbing creepy as some of T.K. Fisher's other horror stories have been, possibly because the elements of horror in this were just not something that really got to me. It's got creepy f fungi in it and that's pretty much it. Um, but it has this like darker gothic creepy house vibe to it that I, I did quite like. Um, and the thing that I, I think is most interesting about this story actually is that it doesn't really have Vernon's like trademark humor in it. It's not, it seemed like a much more serious story without like the wise cracks and stuff like that. And I really love Vernon's humor. I kind of missed that, but I also like that this was something quite different from her other horror stories and that was nice. So what moves the dead? It does really live up to the cover art. Like if you go into it expecting it to feel the way that this looks, y you would get what you wanted. <laughs> Next up is Inhibitor Phase by Alistair Reynolds. This is a science fiction novel that came out last year, I think. It is in the Revelation Space universe, and I have read the Revelation Space trilogy. I liked the first book, the second and third books, not so much. Um, I think my issue with this series overall, and also with Inhibitor Phase, is it goes into some pretty like dark territory. Like we're talking cannibalism and torture and just some really horrible things that humans do to each other, even when they're trying to survive a common threat. <laughs> and it gets to me, it's like a little bit darker than I prefer to read sometimes. Um, so in this universe, um, humanity's entire existence has been threatened by this like 
alien machines that they've woken up that their directive is to kill sentient life. Like anything that goes above a certain level of civilization and technology, they're targeted and wiped out. So humanity is on the verge of extinction because of these inhibitors or what are called the wolves. And this story is basically about trying to find a MacGuffin weapon that can be used against the wolves and some sort of last big stand. So it mostly follows a man named Miguel de Ryder, who he's living at a like hidden human settlement and a mysterious woman appears. She knows way more about him than he knows about himself and she whisks him off to go do something with her to find this like weapon. And along the way, he's kind of recovering his memories. Why is he so important to this whole plan? Um, and then they're just trying to get some more information and get to this weapon. It, it was actually a pretty interesting story. There are some really complex characters in this. There are some characters that recur from the Revelation Space books, like Pinky, who I, I vaguely remembered Scorpio. Um, so it's, it's all connected and I was getting into it. I was like, okay, they're gonna achieve this thing. And then it's just sort of over. There, there must be a sequel to this coming out at some point and I'm not sure if that's been announced or not, but this is like only the first half of the story. It's a search for a weapon and then it just sort of ends. So clearly there must be more. Um, so yeah, I did, I did like this. I thought it was a good story and then minus the super dark points, which I didn't super like. So I want part two. I want to know if this, this whole thing was worth it, basically. Next up is a nonfiction book about genetics and the history of our genes called A Brief History of Everyone Who Ever Lived by Adam Rutherford. This was published in 2016, so it predates, or very slightly predates, some major recent developments in gene editing, so that wasn't talked about at all. But I really enjoyed this. Um, it was just a really solid, like, refresher on the history of genetics, and history of like the evolution of the human species and our cousin species, and then the modern day and some guesses about what's gonna happen next in the future in the fields of genetics and biology. And I, I really like that. It's been a while since I read anything about genetics. It's one of my favorite topics. It's one of my favorite things to read about and I just don't get into it enough. Um, so yeah, I just sort of picked this up on a whim really liked it and I need to go like find a bunch of recently published books on the topic and, and get back into this. So would definitely recommend this if you are interested in learning more about the history of genetics. If you want like the whole shebang, I would highly recommend The Gene by Siddhartha Mukherjee, but this is a slightly shorter book and I think it's a little bit more recent. And with that, I need to take a break because my dad is here to pour some concrete. <laughs> Okay, back to the books. Next up is Rosebud by Paul Cornell. This is a science fiction novella about the crew of a spaceship that encounters an alien presence. Only it's really bonkers because the ship crew are all like digital sentient beings, uh, not humans, but like created by humans in various ways. How did they even end up being the crew of the spaceship. They're all very zany, they all have different um, like physical representations of themselves, and they all have some serious like personality and mental health issues. Um, and then basically, yeah, they encounter an alien ship that does very strange things with their subjective experience of reality, and they are exploring it and trying to figure out what it is, while at the same time kind of struggling with their identities and their connection to this like corporation that controls everything, that literally like controls their thoughts and everything. So it was interesting. I actually really enjoyed it and just the fast pace of it, just how zany it was, but the personalities were a little bit more like weird internet bonkers than I like all the time. So this this really is nothing like what I thought it was gonna be. With a title like Rosebud, knowing what that reference is, I was like, what is this gonna be? So yeah, I liked this quite a bit. 
And lastly, I have a historical romance novel. This is The Perfect Crimes of Marion Hayes by Kat Sebastian. It is a follow-up to The Queer Principles of Kate Webb, which I read last year and really enjoyed. And honestly, because of the timeline and the shared characters, um, Perfect Crimes is kind of like a different view of the same events in uh, The Queer Principles of Kit Webb, just with characters who are more off the page in that one. Um, I liked this. I thought I was gonna really dislike the pairing because Marion was not my favorite in the previous book, but being inside of her head a bit more um, and interacting with other characters, I came to appreciate her a bit more as a character who's, who is conflicted and also kind of conflicting to read. Uh, so basically, Marion has been blackmailed by Rob, the dude on the cover, um, over something that neither of them actually want. <laughs> uh, it's a bizarre situation involving her being married to a man who m might be Rob's father and her daughter might be Rob's half-sister, but also Marion's best friend might also be Rob's half-brother. And it's just no, there's a lot going on here. There's unintentional bigamy, etc. So I think the story is really about Marion having had a horrible year where her whole life has basically fallen apart and she discovers that, you know what, there is actually a good guy out there who will take care of her and will do what he can to make her happy and to make her prioritize her own happiness. I really liked Rob. I grew to like Marion more, but Rob was absolutely my favorite. He's this very sociable guy. He walks into a bar and like five minutes later, everybody's his best friend and he's, you know, holding the babies and stuff. So <laughs> there was quite a bit of baby holding in these stories, which I think is really funny. So I just, I liked, I liked their dynamic. I liked how Rob was very understanding and kind and gentle and trying to give Marion what she needed, even if she didn't know that she needed it. Um, I also like that there wasn't like this horrific third act breakup where they're like, we are not good for each other. We can't be together. They actually like, try pretty hard to find a way to be together and they don't fight over a solution, I guess. So. I enjoyed this. I don't know if there's gonna be another one. I feel like there might have been another couple introduced in this one and not not really. So maybe this is the end of this duology, but yeah, I really like Kat Sebastian's historical romances a lot. And uh, that is everything that I have read over the past couple of weeks. I've really been enjoying reading more new releases in August. I am participating in New release thon and it's, yeah, it's been nice to read new things. I keep saying I'm going to do that and then I just read back catalog stuff. So it's been good so far. Uh, I don't know how much I'm going to be around for the rest of August. Like I said, I am busy. I've got stuff going on and I'm going to be traveling at the end of the month as well for Worldcon in Chicago. So I will try to make some more videos this month, but I'm gonna have to play it by ear. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being here and I'll be back to talk to you soonish about more books. And until then, bye.